I'll say good afternoon to all of us here. So uh, this is a take two of this morning's Heart Sutra meeting. Uh, I had a bad uh, technology day as usual, and we I forgot to record this morning's meeting. So uh, we're going to do it again, and um, hopefully it'll be more smooth than it was anyway. <laughs> Might be better to re-record what happened this morning anyway. But uh, So I am down in Conway at Lacey's at Lacey's place here again. So we're, we're uh, enjoying the, the um, regulated climate control down here. It's been pretty, pretty cold up at Gilbutsuji and we've got much better internet and very good company down here. So we're coming at you from Conway, Arkansas. Anyway, so from the, a, a bit of a review from last week, um, we said uh, some things about uh, these lines, this line, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, when deeply practicing Prajnaparamita, clearly saw that all five aggregates are empty and thus relieved all suffering. So we talked about the <clears throat> five skandhas and we began to talk about emptiness, emptiness from the perspective of early Buddhism, which really emphasized, of course, the emptiness of self. So when the Buddha talked about uh, the five skandhas in the, the um, sutta that we discussed, he said the five skandhas are empty of self. They're impermanent and empty of self. In, in Mahayana Buddhism, we begin to talk, you know, more clearly about, or more explicitly, not more clearly, but more explicitly about things that are implicit in what the Buddha taught. So, uh, you know, we talk about emptiness as impermanence and uh, lack of self, uh, non-self. And uh, in non, when we say non-self, we can include in that dependent origination. You know, um, we don't have an independent uh, self because the self is conditioned by other things. So in my Mahayana Buddhism, we say that explicitly. Emptiness is impermanence and not self. So um, the next, uh, actually we didn't discuss the last in uh, the last part of the, the line there, relieved all suffering. So, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva saw that all five skandhas are empty uh, and relieved all suffering. So the Bodhisattva of compassion, and as we said before, this uh, you know Bodhisattva represents really our life, um, our life as compassion, wisdom, and compassion as one. So um, this Avalokiteshvara saw that the, all five skandhas are equal to maha, or as in maha prajna paramita, that means this ultimate reality, this uh, reality that includes everything. So this reality where there is no suffering because uh, there's no comparison, it is this reality, uh, includes everything. So suffering is eliminated because um, we see that everything we encounter is our life, basically. Um, and this is the absolute reality of, of self. And we'll talk to this, uh, talk about this a little bit more um, as far as what this really means for our practice, I think, in this absolute reality and the end of suffering. So um, the next line is, O oh, Shariputra, form does not differ from emptiness. Emptiness does not differ from form. Form itself is emptiness. Emptiness itself form. 
So actually, in uh, I think it's in Red Pine's commentary, he says that this O Shariputra, I can't remember the Sanskrit word now, but he, he said it actually means here, the literal translation. So uh, it's actually kind of a, it might be an important thing. Uh, basically, here and now, you know, Shariputra form does not differ from emptiness. But um, anyway, of course, Shariputra was considered the one of the great disciples of the Buddha. He was known for his great wisdom, his mastery of the teachings. Um, he sometimes, you know, taught uh, in the Buddha's place. And it's said that he uh, was the compiler, the legend goes, that he was the compiler of the Abhidharma or, you know, the uh, commentaries on the suttas that were actually developed later um, after the Buddha's death, apparently. But uh, it's it said that he compiled these, even some schools say that he wrote some of the Abhidharma. So there's a good chance that this is significant in that the Heart Sutra is addressing Shariputra because he represents Abhidharma philosophy or uh, maybe, you know, clinging to Abhidharma philosophy in this instance. But um, so anyway, the Buddha said, of course, as we discussed, there are only five skandhas and none of these skandhas uh, has a permanent self, it contains any permanent self. They're all empty of self. Uh, but later in um, Abhidharma development, some of the monks developed, you know, a philosophy. Some schools developed philosophies where it's said that uh, actually some of the elements of these five skandhas were permanent, that they endured through time. And um, it's very complicated, the philosophy, but uh, basically we would say it comes down to them saying that uh, some of these dharmas are actually permanent or some elements of these five skandhas are permanent. And in particular, there was a uh, system of 75 dharmas that one school developed that became very influential. And as I said, they said that the five skandhas themselves were empty of self, but in, in some of these uh, 75 dharmas or elements of experience or existence that those continued. And we'll talk a little bit about what this word dharma means in just a minute is and used in this way. Um, so this is kind of a criticism of that philosophy, I think, this particular uh, part of the Heart Sutra. Um, so um, why is it a problem when we say that there is some element of experience that endures. You know, um, why is there a problem when we say there's something that doesn't ever change and is enduring uh, throughout time? So for me, I mean, the main reason that is, is that the, the way that we're able to practice is through change. You know, uh, if there's any part of the human experience or any part of the human being that doesn't ever, isn't possible for it to change, there's a problem because the Buddha's teaching was all based on this uh, principle of impermanence that we can awaken, we can change. Um, you know, in Mahayana Buddhism, we, we also talk about it in terms of uh, we can talk about it in terms of Indra's net, the way that we've talked about it in these meetings uh, before. So to say that there's some part of Indra's net that doesn't change and is not conditioned by other things means that it's outside of Indra's net. So Indra's net, of course, is this 
net thrown across the universe, this metaphor in, in a particular sutra that says that, um, you know, each part of the net is connected to every other part of the net and influences each part of the net, you know, and each um, juncture of the net, there's a jewel that reflects all other jewels and the entirety of the net. But if we have one of those jewels that doesn't reflect the entirety of the net, it's actually not in the net and the, the reflection isn't possible. Um, you know, the way that my, my teacher talks about Ender's net, he updated it somewhat, I think, to more uh, current times. He calls it the network of interdependent origination. And, you know, so there's this idea that the universe is like a network of everything influencing and changing every other thing. You know, there's a flow of interconnectedness that uh, is the universe itself. But if there's some part of these channels that are blocked, if there's something in that that is blocked, you know, the network doesn't work. You know, if you have some part of a network, a telephone system or something, for example, that goes down, it, re it influences the entirety of the whole network and it doesn't function as it as it should. So basically to say that there's something that doesn't change below our perception is sort of like talking about, you know, a noumenon, like some ultimate reality below the surface of our experience that is more real than this reality that we're experiencing. Like there is some kind of mystical thing that we need to discover or get in touch with. And, and the Buddha was clear that that was not his teaching, that he um, did not want to investigate uh, metaphysics like that. And that's a, a characteristic of the Buddha's teaching, I think, that um, it only addressed our, our life as we live it, it's not a theoretical or mystical teaching. So, um, okay, then, uh, so that's the reason that we uh, say that, um, that's the reason we have a problem with, you know, something being outside of uh, change or something being permanent. That's, that's not a Buddhist teaching. So that's part of the reason that this uh, sutra is, is criticizing that. Um, so to uh, talk about emptiness in uh, the Mahayana tradition, it might be good to talk about Nagarjuna, who really uh, drew out these emptiness teachings and is of course, you know, very well known for that. He was, he's considered the 14th patriarch of Zen. He's a important master in many, many traditions. And um, he was the founder of the Madhyamaka school. Uh, it's said, that I'm not sure if that's, we're certain of that, that he actually started the school when he was alive or not. But um, anyway, there's a, one very famous verse here that um, we can talk about and let's see if the screen sharing I can get going this time. So anyway, let's just read over this. Uh, we have a quote from uh, Nagarjuna's Mula Madhyamaka Karika. And it's very famous, these lines, of course. So he says, the Dharma teaching of the Buddhas Buddha rests on two truths, the conventional truth and the ultimate truth. Who do not know the distinction between the two truths, they do not understand reality in accordance with the profound teachings of the Buddha. The ultimate truth is not taught independently of customary ways of talking and thinking. Not having acquired the ultimate truth, nirvana is not attained. 
dependent origination we declare to be emptiness. It, emptiness is a dependent concept. Just that is the middle path. So um, there's so many things that we could say and that have been written about uh, Nagarjuna's teaching, but we won't, you know, spend a lot of time on all the different parameters of it. But basically, of course, what he's saying, uh, you know, there are these two truths. One, the relative truth, where uh, nothing in relative truth has meaning unless it's compared to something else. So a relative truth means it only has relative meaning. So I'm a man because we can compare it to, you know, somebody who's a woman or non-binary or whatever uh, category we have in our particular society. Uh, you know, something is pure because there's something else that's defiled. Um, one of the issues is, is that what is pure and what's defiled changes over time across culture and um, across uh, yeah, time, you know, epochs, different times and different cultures. So something that is taboo in one culture is completely accepted in another. So that's kind of the problem or that's the problem with a relative truth that we grasp as an ultimate truth. So, and so a universal truth or an ultimate truth, the ultimate truth, or the isn't even the right word, ultimate truth um, means, you know, this uh, truth that includes everything, this uh, maha or this universal truth that is usually in the Garja's teaching, you know, we talk about it in terms of unity. Uh, of um, lack of any separation. You know, this is the, the source of wisdom that all things are sharing one particular reality. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but um, so what this teaching is telling us in these two truths and what in his statements are is that, you know, uh, we use these relative truths uh, in our everyday life, but each of these things are empty. That means they're impermanent and conditioned by other things. So, in other words, uh, I take this example of a waterfall. Uh, this is often used in Zen teaching. I didn't mean to use the same actual example that my teacher does in his commentary, but... I probably forgot that's where I got it from, but it's actually a, a uh, you know, very ancient uh, symbol of emptiness is a waterfall, a very ancient um, Zen teaching. But so there's a waterfall just to the north of our property or on the northern part of our property at Gibutsuji. And I like to go there and sometimes, you know, watch the waterfall and enjoy it and take in the sounds and the sights of the waterfall. But I rarely, you know, I rarely can do that in August because it's a seasonal waterfall. It only runs uh, about half the year at the most. And by August, it's all dried up. So is it really a waterfall, you know, in August? No. You know, the water is just one of the conditions that are is making this kind of formation of rock and dirt and trees and um, a gorge in the, in the land into a waterfall. So, uh, you know, when we even when it's running, when we look at the waterfall, we see how the different rocks are conditioning the flow of the waterfall. Uh, conditioning the flow of the water so you can I can come back one time and a, and a rock has fallen one of the larger rocks has shifted or a tree is falling into the 
waterfall and it's essentially a different flow of water. So it's changing all of the time. And um, right after a big rainfall, the water is flowing in a very different way than it does, you know, uh, in early spring when it might be warmer and starting to dry up. Uh, so we actually can look at all of the things that are make up a waterfall and see that there's really nothing there that we can pin down as the waterfall. So the rocks are part of the waterfall, that, but they influence or condition the flow of the water. Um, different things that might uh, fall into the waterfall, like in the fall, the leaves fall down into it and the water is kind of backed up and it looks very much very different. Of course, over hundreds or thousands of years, it'll, you know, the waterfall altogether will shift and disappear even maybe in the spring might uh, dry up or it might be redirected somewhere else and there's no waterfall there at all. But um, the waterfall is just a series of collections of, of uh, conditions. It's just a formation in the rocks, the, the rain um, that produces the water that flows. And we can see, you know, if you take a picture of a waterfall and then you take another one, one second later, it will, you'll get a picture of a different waterfall because the water is always flowing and, and uh, shifting in different ways. And so, um, it's just like the old saying, you never step into the same st stream twice because the water is flowing through and you're, it's a different stream. So our life is the same way. Actually, each human being is like this waterfall, different from moment to moment and conditioned by the things and, and impermanent. So, um, but that's what the guardian is pointing to, but we go ahead and call it a waterfall. That's the relative truth. Um, so from that relative perspective, I can tell somebody how to go and enjoy the waterfall, but from the absolute perspective, if I just say everything's one and there's no waterfall, there's no way for me to have anyone, you know, to give anyone directions to go see it or to describe, you know, um, when to go, what time of year to go, or how to best uh, find it through the landmarks that are there. So there's, you know, there's a path there that's also worn. And the way that I find the waterfall somewhat is to follow the path that's, that's worn in the blueberry bushes that grow around the area. But um, those are relative things, you know, in his statement here where he says, um, Emptiness, the word emptiness itself is a dependent concept. So waterfall is a dependent concept. Um, it's a conventional, uh, here this translation calls it a, uh, what, what is the word they use here? Why can't I? Customary. Okay, this one calls it um, customary ways of talking and thinking. Other translations say something like um, common practices or everyday practices. That means our everyday life. So without using our everyday language and our everyday way of communicating and seeing things, we can't approach the ultimate truth that we can't practice. So the, the path, so to speak, to the waterfall is just a series of, you know, uh, missing bushes or <laughs> the way that um, the bushes or the little shrubs are arranged and, and the dirt, but um, we can call it a path and, and uh, it will actually teach us something, you know, to go look at the waterfall. So, um, that's basically, I think, what, what he's saying. 
here in this uh, in those lines there. Um, but basically, he's saying the waterfall, though, is a concept, a relative truth. So the waterfall is just an idea. Uh, it's something that we pick out of our environment. Uh, you know, it's something that the mind, the five skandhas, through its through samskara, skanda, or through our conditioning or karma, we pick something out of our environment and call it a waterfall. Um, but we can do this with other things. You know, we can do this with. Uh, we can pick out things that are not so tangible, like uh, somebody's philosophy or ethnic background or their um, intelligence or their uh, goodness or badness or their validity as a human being. <laughs> These are all things that the mind creates, but when we grasp those things as relative I mean as absolute truth that's a big problem if we don't understand the absolute truth that these are only concepts we we suffer and we create suffering for others um, so and the other thing that we do is that when we're having an experience we off often compare it to something else. So actually the waterfall by my house is completely a unique experience in every moment. And, um, but when I go to see that waterfall, I could say, well, this is a pretty good waterfall, but I've seen other waterfalls that I like better or worse. <laughs> I can say, this is the most you know amazing waterfall I've ever seen. Or I can say, this is pretty good, but compared to Niagara Falls, it's, it's not good at all. And that's the um, that's one's big source of suffering for us as human beings. You know, to be what we do is we interpret our thoughts and our judgments as ultimate truth, and they're actually conditioned by other things. They're empty, and they're they're not ultimate truth. Um, so, you know. That's the way we judge ourselves too. We judge ourselves as worthy or unworthy, superior or inferior um, through these relative truths. And that's a problem. Um, so the way, this is where we come back to the part here of how Avalokiteshvara relieved all suffering when he or she saw that all five skandhas are empty. Um, that means is this reality here and now is ultimate truth. You know, the past is gone and the future hasn't come yet. Those are ideas. Those are just concepts. When we cling to, you know, things that we regret from the past or injustices that have happened to us in the past, suffering arises in the moment in the, in the, but we make comparisons of, about uh, our past and how it should have been and how this present moment is not as good as it should be or we look to the future for something better and uh, because this moment is not up to snuff these are the kinds of things that cause us suffering so um this is the part where i was going to show uchamarochi's diagrams on this uh, ultimate, um, this universal self, he called it. So he said that we um, judge ourselves through these kinds of universal I'm sorry, these kinds of relative, relative uh, comparisons. So we have, you see how he has a boundary here of the self inside, and there's a boundary of things outside of it, uh, keep you know, separating it from other things. And so we define ourselves in all these different ways, like we're poor because someone else is rich. 
Um, we, we're a loser because someone else is winning in society. We feel powerless because uh, society has the power. Um, as I was saying before, uh, we compare ourselves to, you know, a husband or wife, and that makes us a spouse. All of these things are changing all of the time. And, you know, as I was saying earlier today, I'm teaching now as a Zen teacher, but um, later on, if I go to the grocery store, the cashier is not going to see me as a teacher or they're going to not going to care anything about what Nagarjuna says. They're just going to worry about getting me checked out. I'm a customer. So that is who I am in the moment. There's no enduring um, person that's not conditioned by something else to make it what it is in the moment. And that's what Nagarjuna basically said in his, you know, in this great writing of his is that um, everything is conditioning each other to, uh, to make it what it appears to us in the, in the moment, in the relative truth. So um, here's another one, the competitive self, which Amaroshi said, you know, this is our strategy. If we just work hard and study and catch up and pass others, then um, we can, um, you know, get what we want. <laughs> He has all of these things. We feel powerless in society, but if we somehow work hard and compete and do better than someone else, we can get power. If we, uh, you know, try to uh, compete with somebody for another job or for other resources, you know, we either win or lose. But we're the, you know, we're the most important thing in our own minds. But um, Often, we don't turn out on the side of this kind of relationship that we want to. We see ourselves as inferior to others or someone else, we see their talent. We don't have talent. And then these other more, you know, um, usual you know, non-charged kind of relationships, the salesman and the customer, um, then we can go the other way too. We can feel inferior or superior. If we work hard and get ahead, you know, and we, we judge ourselves uh, a winner and somebody else is a loser, a loser. We can buy the nice cars um, or the nice things that define us as superior. But of course we all know that this is not a good strategy because uh, we can't win in every competition and things uh, don't fulfill us. The stuff that we we get um, gets old and we have to get something else to be to be uh, up with the latest fashion or the latest cars or the latest whatever it might be. So but when we see ourselves as uh, the universal self of just here and now, these comparisons don't apply. And that's what Nagarjuna is saying, that there is no inferior or superior in this ultimate reality of, of emptiness. And that's the, um, that's the end of suffering. So that's the way that uh, Avalokiteshvara and in suffering by seeing the emptiness of the five skandhas, I think. Uh, so, and this was, in, I was relating this morning, um, you know, Avalokiteshvara for me had quite a big meaning to me It's for some period of my practice, especially I was, uh, one day it just occurred to me that I understood what it meant to be forgiven of all of my past uh, missteps and mistakes and, in, and um, in, uh, um, insufficiencies or my inadequacies were all forgiven in the, in the present moment by Avalokiteshvara. I think that's one way we can, we can talk about it. Um, 
So, you know, as I was re relating this morning, there was a time uh, nine years ago when I established Gyobutsuji, this small place to allow people to come and practice the Dharma. We, I, you know, I found in this place as a part of my vow with the many many other people and things coming together to support me to do that. Um, you know, I didn't really do it, of course, according to these teachings, especially we understand that we, that we don't do things by ourselves in isolation, but uh, we do take a vow to use this body and mind to, to, our, to the best of our ability to fulfill this universal vow to help others um, alleviate suffering as part of our bodhisattva vow. So there was some, you know, period, uh, some time several years ago when someone came to practice at Gyobutsuji um, and as a result of that, she passed away. I mean, it was in a direct result of coming to Gyobutsuji that she passed away because of an allergic reaction to the, the plants out there or something or the, the pollen or some element of the environment. So um, it's at times like these that, you know, we have to say, we have to let go of everything that we thought uh, is the Dharma or everything that we think we're, we're working for doesn't make sense. You know, I, you open this, I open this place for practice and it, it results in something that I can't say is good in any way. I can't uh, bring any kind of meaning or rationale for, for that as supporting the Dharma whatsoever. So um, but in this moment of just here and now, you know, we we can come back to our faith or we can come back to our vow. But if we think, uh, you know, unless a certain thing happens in the way that our vow unfolds, that it's no good, um, you know, we, we might end up giving up our vow. In this particular case, I just knew that there really wasn't much else to do to, but to keep going uh, rather than, you know, I could have just stopped and said, everything is meaningless because this place that I thought was part of my vow caused something horrible to happen to somebody. But um, that's where we have to see, you know, I have to see the emptiness of my own, even my deepest held convictions of what I think the Dharma is and what I don't think it is. Um, and it's, this relates to a little bit more to a part coming up um, here in just a minute that I'll talk about. So, um, okay, so this part here uh, about, let's see. Come back to um, something here that I wanted to talk about. Um, Okay, I just wanted to make sure that this part here about um, without relying on everyday common practices, as Nagarjuna said, 
the absolute truth cannot be expressed. Um, this really does mean that, you know, emptiness itself is form and, and form is emptiness, of course, but um, without form, there is no emptiness either. Without emptiness, there is no form, and without form, there is no emptiness. Um, you know, um, there is no uh, there is no way that we can see a waterfall, or a, fa a waterfall can be a waterfall without the emptiness of change. You know, a static, unchanging waterfall isn't a waterfall, and um, there is no you know, change in the way that we see things without this interconnection or this emptiness itself. There's no um, no way that we can see change without seeing form. So that's coming back to this uh, this idea of, of um, not being able to practice or not being able to approach emptiness or not being able to approach ultimate truth without conventional everyday ways of uh, living our life, you know, without um, the ability to, for example, set up this meeting and set a time uh, to get on a Zoom meeting and use language and um, speak to others there's no way to talk about the Dharma and there's no way, there's no way to understand the teachings in the way that we can come to this truth that can't be spoken about. You know, there's no, there's no way to meet this truth that can't be spoken about without saying something about it. So, so Nagarjuna, in his statement, he's saying that the name, you know, one of these everyday practices is by saying the name waterfall. That's a provisional name for, for emptiness. Okay, so um, to try to maybe clarify this a little bit more. I wanted to go back to um, the document that, that I put together here. So this is just a little thing that um, I wanted to really kind of look at and explore the relationship between this uh, Kachayana Sutta that we've talked about before. I mean, maybe, maybe I should put that up again and actually talk, just talk about this for a second or just read it um, just briefly. The Buddha says, the world in general, Kachayana, inclines to two views, to, to existence or non-existence. But for him, who with the highest wisdom sees the uprising of the world as it really is, non-existence of the world does not apply. And for him, who with highest wisdom sees the passing away of the world as it really is, existence of the world does not apply. The world in general, Kachayana, grasps after systems and is imprisoned by dogmas. But he who does not go along with that system grasping, that mental obstinacy and dogmatic bias, does not grasp it at it, does not affirm, this is myself. He knows without doubt or hesitation that whatever arises is merely dukkha, that what passes away is merely dukkha. And such knowledge is his own, not depending on anyone else. 
this kachayana is what constitutes right view. Everything exists. This is one extreme, extreme view. Nothing exists. This is the other extreme. Avoiding both the streams, the Tathagata teaches a doctrine of the middle. And then here he talks about conditioned um, arising, basically, dependent arising after this. So he's equating, you know, um, not holding to, on to views as uh, dependent or arising and impermanence here. So um, this, that's, we'll go back to this one. So here in the, um, you know, blue here is the Kachayana Sutta. And then here in the red uh, parts are, are Nagar, Nagarjuna. So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, it's something that people can kind of look at if you want to. And it's not, this isn't, this is just something I worked it over and over and put things in different places. And it's just a work in progress. Uh, so anyway, but I think it's very interesting and helpful to see how these Prajnaparamita teachings are, are grounded in the early teachings of the Buddha. So if we talk about the uprising of the world as the Buddha did, if we see the uprising of the world, the non-existence of the world does not apply. So the uprising of the world, I think in the Garjana's uh, statements, we can think of as relative truth or dependent origination, which basically means, you know, cause and effect. That's the uprising of the world. So um, the passing away of the world, when we see the passing away of the world, we understand that existence of the world does not apply. You know, eternalism does not apply. This one is about nihilism. And this one is about, you know, um, eternalism. So we see the passing away of things and we don't think that there's some ultimate thing that lasts forever that we need to, you know, grasp and then we have the final answer. So this we can, um, in, in a Garjanus statement, I think this, has to do with ultimate truth, you know, the ultimate truth of impermanence. That's really the, the truth of unity. All things are unified by impermanence. And we see the connection, the, the final, you know, sort of destination of everything is impermanence. So this, I think, is the, the kind of root of the, the ultimate truth. Um, so here in the Kachyana Sutra, the right view, he calls also, also the doctrine or the Dharma of the middle. And in Nagarjuna, I think, you know, usually we would say Shunyata is ultimate truth, but I think Shunyata is both ultimate and relative truth. You know, uh, this is kind of a interpretation, but I don't think that, you know, emptiness means unity, really. It means going beyond unity and individuality. And that's the middle path. That's the middle path, you know, that's why we could use this individuality, this, these relative truths in the Garjana's teaching in order to express or approach the ultimate truth. But we really can only do this in Zazen. In Zazen, we give up all of our ideas about individual reality or relative truths and ultimate truths as well. Um, 
And we just sit in that truth that includes both ultimate and individual, you know, reality. So here, you know, a, a waterfall is a waterfall. It's not a waterfall. It's beyond waterfall and not waterfall. Anyway, these are other things that we could talk about, but I won't, you know, spend a lot of time on it. But this is my teacher's formula, one equals zero equals infinity. <laughs> and so he said, you know, one is the individual or self. And then early Buddhism saw no self, you know, emptiness of self. And then like in Nagarjuna's teachings, we see infinity, emptiness of all things, you know, it's where we understand that this uh, zero actually means infinity. And I think this is, as I spoke of last week, we really see this in, in the Buddha's teaching too. So, okay, we'll stop this one now. Um, make sure. So the next line, uh, it says, the Heart Sutra says, sensations, perceptions, formations, and consciousness are also like this. Of course, you know, this means that all of the five skandhas are empty. Um, form is just a sort of a placeholder for all five skandhas. So this mind and this body are all conditioned and empty. So, um, you know, my thoughts are just things that are produced by my, my uh, history, by my body, you know, by my uh, experience, by my, you know, genetic makeup, um, by the time that I'm raised in, by the society I live in, the culture, the things that I uh, experienced growing up, those things are all empty and none of them have some ultimate truth. You know, this is a very important thing to understand. Um, you know, we, as I was saying earlier, we talk, we think of our mental faculties as ultimate truths when indeed, you know, they're, they're just relative truths that don't have any meaning outside of um, their relationship to something else. So um, the next part of the sutra says, Shariputra, all dharmas are marked by emptiness. So in this particular statement, I think the, the Heart Sutra really clarifies that emptiness is not some kind of realm that we try to get to, but it's actually the way our life is. So, um, you know, impermanence is a waterfall or it's the nature of a waterfall. It's not um, some numinous thing that we have to get to, you know, that's outside of our regular experience. It's the way that things are, the way that things unfold. And so to talk a little more specifically then, what this dharma means, um, this idea of dharma is uh, really, you know, has to do with, as I said, the 75 dharmas in the Abhidharma philosophy, of especially this one particular school. Um, but there are different, you know, different numerations. Some had 125 dharmas or, you know, Basically, they're just this elemental part of experience that we can't break down any further. And um, you know, you hear Dharma used in different ways, like the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. 
or you hear about, you know, the Dharma as the teaching uh, or the reality of life as it is the, the Dharma body of the of the Buddha, like the law is another way, the law of cause and effect. But this Dharma is different. It's talking about that elemental experience um, of our of our life, the elemental experience of existence or the, the most indivisible piece of our existence. So, um, you know, I think I mentioned this earlier, but some, some schools started to say that these dharmas had some essential nature out of trying to explain things like, you know, time, cause and effect and, and karma. They couldn't get around saying that some of these elemental experiences had some kind of lasting or impermanent, I mean, permanent uh, existence and that they were not conditioned by other things. Um, so this is an important part, I think, of the sutra. Um, let me go back to the Kachayana Sutra again. The next part of the, the Heart Sutra says, these dharmas, they neither arise nor cease. They don't arise or cease. And if we go back, I think directly to the Kachayana Sutta, um, we can see exactly what we're talking about here. For he, Buddha, the Buddha says here, for him who with the highest wisdom sees the uprising of the world as it really is, non-existence of the world does not apply. Right in here. And for him who, with the highest wisdom, sees the passing away of the world as it really is, existence of the world does not apply. So that's how these uh, dharmas neither arise nor cease. Um, I think that, you know, we, we, it's talking really back to the basics of the Buddha of not getting caught in some kind of eternalism saying that, you know, there's some dharma that uh, um, you know, some dharma that uh, is outside of emptiness that is not subject uh, to cause and effect and impermanence. Um, and that means there's no dharma, you know, there's really no dharma at all because uh, they don't arise nor cease because we can't find the beginning or the end of anything like a waterfall, you know, or a, or any, a dharma. We can't find where it really starts and where it really ends. So, but when with the highest wisdom, with the wisdom of Zazen, when we just see the uprising of the world or the uprising or the um, individuality, you know, of the waterfall, and we see um, also the impermanence, um, you know, the non-existence of the waterfall. Both of these things together are, you know, shunyata. And we, we only realize that in our zazen practice or in our relating to the world, being informed by our, our zazen practice. So, you know, another way we can think about this, too, is the example, as I like to give, is uh, the baby. The baby passing away is the uh, arising of the toddler, or the arising of the toddler is the passing away of the baby. Um, so, um, we can't really say there's no individual there, no baby, but or no toddler, but they, they actually, uh, the arising of one is the 
falling away of the other. And so actually there's no arising and no falling away in that instance. They're completely conditioning each other. But the whole idea of a baby is just in our mind. It's a conceptual uh, construct. And, you know, the idea of a toddler is too. Um, there's no mark that says, you know, this now is a baby and this is next, the next moment they're a toddler. So um, it's, it's just this here and now, you know, there's some being unfolding, some phenomena unfolding. Uh, that's part of, I think, what, what this is saying here about these dharmas neither arising or ceasing. You know, for it, but here again, it, it's important to understand this, I think, because if we think that it's referring to something that is mystical or beyond our total our experience, like some thing below our everyday experience that endures and never arises and never ceases, that, that's a problem. You know, that's not Buddhism, as I was saying before. The Buddha never intended to uh, indicate anything like that. So um, the next part is, are neither defiled nor pure. Um, so this has to do with uh, early Buddhism and the theory of awakening, I think. So it was that thought that the cause of suffering in early Buddhism is ignorance. And um, we practice and uh, we have wisdom arise. And the primary wisdom that we attain is non-self or the ignorance of an individual self is, is el eliminated. But we have these defiled dharmas or these defiled uh, aspects of the human being that we need to uh, eliminate in order to awaken. So greed, hatred, and delusion are the, you know, the primary um, categories of these defilements, these defiled dharmas that we have to somehow practice with and eliminate through wisdom that arises in practice. Um, but of course, you know, if we talk about defilement and purity in terms of uh, emptiness, we see that you know, defilement and purity only have meaning, as I said earlier, in terms of each other. Like, you know, defilement has no meaning unless we relate it to purity. But the problem is, you know, purity uh, and defilement, of course, are terms that change throughout time and culture. And even the interpretation of what they mean in Buddhism, you know, is going to change too. But uh, even beyond that, if we look at this carefully, if something is able to be purified, if there is some dharma that we can purify, that means it's empty, you know, because it can change and it can become uh, something other than uh, defiled. So it's kind of dangerous when we ever, we label something as ultimately evil or ultimately good. And I think this is what the Buddha was getting at here or what, you know, uh, Avalokiteshvara is getting at. Um, you know, the Buddha, one of the primary things that he said was the cause of suffering was uh, dogmas or views and, you know, clinging to a particular view, especially the view that was, is most dangerous, of course, is the view of an individual self. Uh, that is the kind of root of all of our suffering. But anytime we think, you know, I'm right and you're wrong, and there's no way to change that, there's really a, a big danger there. And as someone this morning, you know, it was, uh, Justin this morning was talking about reading from the earliest um, 
the earliest uh, suttas, the ones that really are thought by scholars to contain the Buddha's voice, um, he really emphasized not clinging to views and right view and not arguing and not getting into disputes. You know, those were really things that he emphasized over and over again in his early teaching. And uh, I think, you know, this um, is really important these days, especially too, because uh, th this is the source of kind of, of wars and conflicts and the things that we've seen recently in our, on our, in our American society, these types of, you know, disputes where someone is so sure that one side is good and the other side is evil that they'll stop at nothing to eliminate the other side and, um, you know, promote their own view. But, um, you know, as I said, in this ultimate realm that uh, Nagarjuna spoke of, or there is no comparison. So this is the wisdom, you know, in this ultimate truth, there is no comparison. There is no good and evil. There's only this, this moment, the absolute self uh, with, without past and without future. And that is kind of the medicine for clinging to views and self-righteousness in dogma. But um, also in relation to this defilement and purity, think of this statement by Menzon. He was a Soto, uh, a great Soto monk in I think the 17th or 18th century. Um, he said that we need to be greedy to do good things and we need to be have aversion to doing bad things and we need to have delusion in order to embrace all living beings. So um, I should say too in this meeting we had more than two people this morning. We, we had a few folks, we had our normal, uh, you know, number of folks uh, show up. And um, Russ had a question about this, of, about, you know, what does that really mean to have uh, the delusion in order to um, save, I mean, to embrace all living beings. And I was saying to him is that I think that is a, a primary teaching of the Heart Sutra too, and, and of Nagarjuna that we understand that these relative views uh, are a kind of mistake. You know, it, with the wisdom of the ultimate view where they really know that there is no waterfall, that it's just a collection of different conditions that come together and we conceptually call it a waterfall. But we actually agree to make a mistake and call it a waterfall in order to sh show it to other people, you know, to embrace all living beings or teach the Dharma. We say, um, you know, a waterfall is not a waterfall and it is a waterfall again, you know, this is a kind of classic thing. Um, so we make that mistake uh, but then it's not a mistake. And it's also, a, to me, a, an idea that we kind of let, let down our particular, our worldly wisdom about who, you know, is somebody worthy of teaching the Dharma to and who is not worthy or who, you know, is it worth, are these people worth actually connecting with and trying to make peace with, um, you know, they're so far gone, their views are so out there that there's no way to even talk to them. But uh, the idea here is that we, we do it anyway. You know, we make this delusive decision to go ahead and make a mistake and uh, try to do something impossible. So, um,
So yeah, I think you know if we if there's something in us that we really completely uh, exercise ourselves of, we need to be careful about that. We might be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So our relationship to our greed, hatred, and delusion is really more the point than you know uh, expelling those things from us, like. Um, You know, I was saying this morning when we hear when we heard last summer about the murder of George Floyd, should we have not been upset about that? And should we have then just said, "Well, I'm a Buddhist and uh, I can't have any anger or aversive response to that, so I'm just going to sit zazen and let it go," or and or um, do we do something with that? You know, this unsettled feeling about something isn't quite right. If this is informed by our Zazen practice, uh, this is compassion. So to some people, you know, being compassionate might have been to go out and, you know, demonstrate, or it might be, you know, to write to their, uh, congressperson or to go to the uh, state capitol or whatever it might have been to say, uh, you know, we want change. And, um, and I think I was saying this earlier this morning, some people may not like that me saying this as a Zen priest that I'm, I'm talking about some kind of political view, but uh, we have to be careful because, um, you know, the Dharma itself is not meant to be some way of not taking responsibility for things that are going on in society around us. Um, you know, uh, we, we want to be welcoming and open to all points of view, for example, or all political points of view, but there are some views I think we have to be willing to say, this is not an, an option. This is not a viable option. Like a racist thinking is not really a viable option anymore. It's not like, you know, we want to give racism its due because it's another opinion that should be expressed. But I think that's a, that's a misunderstanding of emptiness. And refers from some of, you know, perspective, it is a mistake to say anything about racism or George Floyd in some some ultimate theoretical way. But um, but practice, I think, uh, opens our hearts and minds, and um, you know, we don't enter into some kind of uh, activity like this to express our our willingness to change things with uh, grasping to a goal so you know if we go into some kind of uh, endeavor to help society change and we think it has to happen a certain way that's a problem because what it really in in our lifetime are we ever going to end all wars are we ever going to be able to completely eradicate racism are we ever going to be able to completely alleviate poverty in our lifetime or in my lifetime am i really going to be able to make a big change in the way people interact with each other or you know in the way society uh, holds uh, racist perspectives from one ultimate view, you know, I'll, no, I mean, I, my opinion or my statement on this is completely a drop of water in a huge ocean. But the, the idea is that we express peace, you know, we express emptiness rather than having to wrestle emptiness into a a result that we think that it has to be 
So we may not bring about the change that we want exactly in the way that we want it, but we need to uh, express express it. You know, we express the the ultimate reality through these relative everyday interactions. And it, you know, it might mean just a lot of it has to do with the way we interact with each other as human beings, but it might also act on uh, society in, in a larger ways through, through more so-called political means. But, um, you know, just because we have a certain spiritual or, or um, you know, religious, so to speak, um, perspective doesn't mean that we can't try to, to help suffering be alleviated in some way in the larger society that we think is important. And, you know, most of these uh, movements the, uh, recently in the last century that like civil rights movements, of course, for example, have been led by, by people in the clergy that are willing to say, yes, this is, you know, really what I think is God's will or, you know, I'll never come out and say, I know what emptiness wants. <laughs> I mean, I can't ever come out and, and presume to say that, but I will try and try to express emptiness in what I do. And, uh, and part of that means trying to understand the cause of, you know, the cause of racism in our society by listening to those who have a different perspective than I do. But, um, you know, whenever we think we have the right way of seeing things and they don't, there's no room for emptiness to, uh, to move or to inform, you know, inform our life. Um, so, uh, so, uh, one, the last part here, I think, we're getting near the last part. Um, the next part of the sutra is they, uh, these dharmas neither increase nor decrease. So I think this is the self beyond gain and loss, as Dogen Zenji talks about it. So usually our usual approach to things is that we have an inbox and we have an outbox and we want to try to get things that we like on the inbox and things that we don't like on the outbox. So we want to increase our good things and decrease the things that we don't like. But in this world of universal self of just here and now, there is no gain and loss because there is no comparison You know, it, we, everything is contained, so there's no way to gain anything and there's no way to lose anything. As you know, the Buddha said the exact reason for our suffering is that we try to get things that we don't want, that we want and get rid of things that we don't want. That's the basic cause of suffering. And, you know, Heart Sutra says there's no attainment, there's nothing to attain because everything is already here and now in the universal life of the self. Um, so the last line, uh, therefore, given emptiness, there is no form, no sensation, no perception. Uh, no formation, no consciousness. So this is, you know, we've talked about the emptiness of the five skandhas, and he's just sort of capping on that. Uh, but he's, I think he's being clear here that we say from the perspective of emptiness, there is no form. You know, we're not saying that there is no self, that, that no self exists, that we're not having an experience right now, but we're saying that that is empty and changing and impermanent all the time. 
So it's not, again, some blank uh, state of nothingness that we're trying to express or get to. So there are no five skandhas because they themselves are in emptiness. And, um, you know, the Buddha talked about this, of course, as I said in, uh, earlier, he talked about the banana tree that, you know, you take off the layers and you find nothing inside. Um, talked about the emptiness of self. Um, okay, I think that's everything that I can think of to say right now. <laughs> and I can't even tell how long I've been talking, so... It's probably too long. Am I forgetting anything that, that I was supposed to say <laughs> that you remember? <laughs> uh, I don't know how to answer that question. That, that would be a, <laughs> I could, uh, could make several jokes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> say like, yeah, I thought you were going to talk about <laughs> say and say something completely unrelated. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, is this a uh, question and answer time? Well, I think so. Yeah, I don't know. I forgot to check the time, uh, so I don't know how long we have. <laughs> We have to go. I mean, maybe I've already been talking an hour and a half. I don't know. But but I think, yeah, there. I don't, I didn't think to check the time myself either, but um, I, I don't, I don't feel like it would spend an hour. But um, so when you talk about um, uh, I'm sorry, let me let me get my thoughts together. So you said earlier, um, the Dharma is not supposed to be some kind of way of not taking responsibility. And you talked about um, uh, systemic racism. And um, so I'm wondering, I remember a couple of years ago, uh, you gave a talk um, in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And I remember you telling this story, but I can't remember exactly the context of the story. So I wonder how applicable you might think, feel that it would be to um, some kind of of Buddha giving some kind of uh, uh, response to to something um, of something of a more political nature of where you were give, you were telling the story of uh, of how there was going to be some kind of war between Buddha's home kingdom um, and the name the neighboring kingdom and that he. Um, kind of essentially blocked their path uh, for a couple of times, um, and each time they the others they saw what he was doing and decided to turn away. But I guess their own karma made it keep happening <laughs> to where after three times, after the third time, um, Buddha decided he. Uh, couldn't block their path anymore that or that their their minds were not going to be changed um can you talk about it, it would that be um some kind of you know and and we can't i know that you can't say that oh yeah this is about <laughs> systemic racism <laughs> but uh you know so the i i know that the context isn't exactly the same, but would you have anything to say about that? <laughs> and I'll mute myself. <laughs> well, 
Um, yeah, I remember that. I think um, yeah, it's there's a story I think you could interpret it in a lot of ways. I mean, basically, I, it was his. Uh, I think it was King Ajishatu was coming to. Um, you know, he heard that this the king was coming to uh, destroy the Shakya clan, the, you know, that was the Buddha's clan. And so, of course, um, that was not a good thing for, for him, uh, for anyone, of course, but his own, uh, I think part of the point was that was his own people, you know. So he, what he did was he sat, the story goes that he sat Zazen in the path or near the path where the invading army was coming to destroy them. And he had some relationship with the king, you know? So um, the first three times, I think it worked where the invading army came and they, they um, I can't remember in the exact conversation that they had with the Buddha or what it was that he said, it was something profound if I'm not mistaken but uh basically they were they turned away each time because of um the Buddha being there and what he said and then the the fourth I think it was the fourth time that the Buddha heard that they were heading to the to the uh Shakya clan again that he he didn't try to stop them and so um, I think one one part of the story is is that he you know he could have raised an army probably and defeated the king, or he could have raised an army and uh, given a lot of resistance and saved his own particular clan um, because he was said to have been you know an expert in martial arts and he'd mastered all of the martial arts when he was a young man and he had a huge following of course of of people but if he would have done that he would have um i think the point of the story is that he entered the world you know without being of the world so to speak that um if he would have raised the army and fought off this other army he wouldn't have been the buddha anymore and so uh he would have entered back into samsara of the you know of of fighting and suffering and he probably he probably would have overcome the invading army but the dharma would have been lost so, you know, whether the thing actually happened or if it's just a figurative kind of teaching, I don't know for sure. I mean, I don't think this story is recorded in any of the early canon. It comes in the commentaries or it's a, you know, a legendary kind of story. But so um, I think it is like something akin, you know, to... Martin Luther King's approach, where he, they refused, of course, to physically fight. But I think it goes, you know, beyond that, that um, we have to be sure that, that when we do enter into these kinds of situations, you know, in society, that we, we have the Dharma as the priority. We have to keep a, a very strong, um grounding in that and as i said rather than having any particular goal met you know the manifestation of emptiness and and uh, wisdom is more important than winning any particular battle i mean as bad as it might sound to us in a certain way but think if the, if we didn't have the teachings of buddhism because of of that one particular ancient empire, you know, that has been gone for many hundreds of years now. You know, empires come and go, but the Dharma is something 
uh, more precious than any of them. But on a, you know, from more like a, a metaphorical, I think, place, I think it means that we have to be sure we don't, we don't go into anger and judgment and killing. Uh, you know, that's not, that's not the Dharma. Um, but he, you know, we do, we do care, we, you know, the heart and the mind open and we do have compassion and we do want to see changes happen in a certain way. But we have to understand that that's a kind of delusion to, you know, the change that we want to happen is a sort of mistake that we make out of compassion, you know? And so, especially when it doesn't happen exactly the way that we think it will, it never, you know, it never really does. Uh, we have to understand and sort of trust that the manifestation of, of uh, the Dharma in our life is, is the, the, the point, you know, the expression of emptiness or the expression of the teaching rather than some particular goal, of course, is, you know, is the point. It's mainly that we can't, uh, you know, we can't go into anger and judgment and fighting. We have to have a boundary there, you know, as far as um, the Dharma goes. You know, it's it's pretty clear that that ain't calling people names and judging them and uh, trying to harm them because they think differently than us is not you know, not the way, but life is very complicated and people defend their families, people, um, you know, it's not, it's not black and white. And so part of these teachings, what they're saying is we have to see each situation for what it is and respond without grasping to some kind of theory about it. You know, we ground ourselves in Zazen, and we ground ourselves in um, the teachings, but uh, most of all, in our ability to let go and face the situation with you know an open heart and, and mind. So, really, you know, these this Heart Sutra at some point is saying you have to give up your idea of what Buddhism is even in order to really express what the Buddha taught. And so, you know, it's like when I was talking about that difficult thing that happened to me, if I just thought that the only worth of the, you know, Gyobutsuji was to nurture these very positive things that I consider positive and that if any, you know, something that I consider outside of the Dharma or the, the, you know, the vow, my vow of what the Dharma is. If anything happened there that I, you know, kind of judge that place or my practice there as evil or no good, then, um, then what, you know, what choice do I have? So, uh, we have to even be be willing to to find some other way of seeing things you know when when the situation becomes uh almost inexplicable or when when it seems that there's nowhere for us to say this is the dharma or this is my vow you know we have to still find some way to live and and face face our lives beyond our ideas of what the Dharma is or what Buddhism is or you know what good is and what bad is, justice or injustice, which are all you know just relative relative concepts, you know, relative truths. Thank you for that. Um 
could you talk a little bit more about, I, th I think you said his, the name was Man Manzon, Manzon. Manzon. Yes. Manzon. Manzon. Um, that, that little poem you, you read of his, um, uh, you said the first line, uh, we need to be greedy to do good things. And that sounds so, uh, um, it, it comes across to me that it sounds like it's so full of life. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I love the way they put that. Can, can you talk a little, you, you talked earlier about uh, we need to be delusional to embrace all beings. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about being greedy to do good things? And I kind of feel like that goes a little bit too with my first question too, uh, when, when talking about like, um, you know, doing something for like social justice, because I, I, like I said, it, it sounds so full of life. So yeah, so I'll, I'll mute myself now. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think that just means it's, it's talking about our relationship with our, with our greed or with our, our um, life energy, so to speak. I mean, we can call it greed or we can call it life energy. It just depends on our relationship with it, you know, and the main, the main um, thing that defines what it is, is, is in our mind or in our heart. So uh, the way that we practice with it. So I think after some, some point of, um, you know, practice, when we really root ourselves in our Zazen practice and we start sinking more deeply into it, we really do find that the things that give us joy and give us fulfillment are things in line with the Dharma. You know, we don't really find much joy in, you know, some greed in being really greedy and trying to exploit someone uh, just to get our sense object, our sense organs uh, stimulated or, you know, to get a little bit more money in the bank or to whatever it might be consciously or unconsciously. But we become it starts bringing us joy to share the Dharma with someone or it starts giving us joy to, um, you know, whatever it might be, do something, give some, something, you know, practice uh, Dana Paramita. So in a way we kind of become greedy. We can say, I mean, I think, as you said, he was making a poetic statement that greed isn't really, you know, greed when uh, we sort of long to do things uh, in in the service of the Dharma, but it really comes back to the uh, the fact that that we have to be sure. You know, all of these things have to be grounded in wisdom. You know, otherwise we give and we think we're being uh, generous and we think we're giving for the Dharma but we're actually back in the, the old nest of doing it for our own ego. I mean, that can, that can happen too. So that's why we have to be really grounded, you know, in, in wisdom and this, these emptiness teachings uh, and, and make sure that we're not, you know, just sort of going along with our normal way of doing things. But I mean, we never maybe possibly always sure you know we can't be positive like um there's always some doubt <laughs> i mean that's part of what this is saying there there's nothing we're never sure about anything but we just keep practicing with it with trying to approach our vow so our our deepest aspiration is to is to manifest you know this joyful mind that Dogen Zenji talked about in offering, you know, joyful mind. 
And uh, we kind of get greedy to do that in, from a certain perspective or that is stimulating to our life energy. Our, our life energy comes up and we get excited about making an offering, you know, and, and then we also get to be, uh, we really start being wary or repulsed by our, our, or, you know, we really want to avoid causing harm. You know, and when we do, when we have to cause harm for some reason, you know, we we are aware of that and we, you know, repent of it. So um, I have to, you know, I have to get rid of insects at Gilbutsuji when the, there are people that come that are allergic to wasps and the wasps are getting very aggressive in the heat of the summer. And, you know, I have to, I have to get rid of those wasps, but uh, I really, you know, it's not a pleasant thing. You know, if we ever start enjoying that or getting greedy to get rid of, you know, to kill things or, you know, that's a problem, but uh, um, we always, you know, need to have uh, the Dharma or our vow in the center of our approach to our relationships with things that we encounter, you know, the things, the subject object relationships that we do have to, of course, embrace, we have to embrace in the, in the light of the Dharma or Zazen, you know, I think is what that's saying. Thank you for that too. One thing that it had made me think of was um, uh, the Oprah thing where she, like, she says, I want a car for everyone. You get a car and you get a car and like gives the whole audience a car. But what you said too made me think, well, well, yeah, that, that could be like greedy uh, to do good things. But it's also not thinking about the sales tax or whatever that these people <laughs> may now <laughs> owe <laughs> or something. And that that could be <laughs> a side effect of uh, something. So like you like you said, you have to uh, come come from the perspective of the Dharma. So I appreciate that very much. And I think that's all the questions I have for now. Okay, well, thank you for bearing with me again through this. And <laughs> um, I apologize for messing up the, <laughs> the original recording. So anyway, I guess we can stop it. We can stop it here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.